Thank you for uh, joining us. I'm Troy Kirby on the Dow of Sports videocast, along with Chris Presson here, who's GM of the Arizona Sun Dogs. Chris, a little bit different being in Prescott. You're in really the Valley of the Sun, but not really. You're about uh, what, two miles up from the Valley of the Sun. Yeah, we like it, though. It's uh, usually f about 15 degrees cooler here in the summer than it is in Phoenix. And while today it's going to be 65 here, it'll be 80 down there. So it's a little, uh, little the opposite this time of year. But we like it. We get four seasons. We get some snow, although not much this year. And we have the mountainous area, so can't beat it. And then you made national news last year because you, nobody let you down from a scissor lift. Kind of tell me about that. <laughs> you know what? It was something that uh, it just took off. We had talked about ways to get attention, as I think everyone in sports, in particular minor league hockey and baseball and basketball, we all do. And, uh, you know, we sat around a boardroom table and said, what can we do that's different? And one thing led to another, and we ended up on the lift. And for some reason it went worldwide and we loved it because we got attention but mo most importantly we met our goal and we exceeded our season ticket sales that we wanted to and uh, virtually tripled our season ticket sales so we were real pleased with it. Season tickets are such a different animal here because if you offend one customer you've offended them for life mm -hmm. and that doesn't just mean you but that means any organization that's actually been selling hockey or baseball or whatever because there's nowhere to go you're, you're just here. Well that's true and you know even more so in this market because we're such a small market that if you don't do something right or you don't do something that someone likes or dislikes everyone in the community knows quickly and so we have to really be connected to our customer, probably more so than most, uh, because of the smallness of our, of our market. Uh, I've worked in lots of other places, much bigger than this, but I like the small town feel. I'm from a small town myself, and so I understand how people think. With season tickets, you also have to work on pricing. You also have to make sure your price point works, mm -hmm. but you also can't give away free tickets. Have you guys had to battle that in the past, and what are some of the kind of outcomes? We have. It's a great question, and it's a very interesting dynamic because I wouldn't expect everyone to understand our business, and most don't. Um, but with that said, we have a, you know, a large expense each night to play in such a beautiful facility, and we have to make sure that we're doing all we can to appease the customer but cover our expenses at the same time. So it's a real interesting dynamic. Then you bring into play the ticketing company, which is a third party in addition to the building that we pay fees on as well. And so again, price point is key in this, particularly a small market, but more so than most places, we really have to watch it here because we, the first two years of the business was great. Years three, four, and five, not so great. And the owner that I currently work for, years five, six, seven, and now eight, uh, we really have to find ways to, to better our product for our fans, better our price point for our fans while covering the expenses at the same time. And that's a, it's a really interesting quotient to have to deal with. How do you avoid things like buyout nights? How do you avoid you know, making it too much about the bobblehead and not a, as much about the rest of the fan experience? That's a hard question to answer. Um, I would say more so than the bobblehead and more so than the giveaway t-shirt, people want to know how much am I going to pay, what's the value I'm getting for that, and how many less expensive nights are you going to run? Um, you know, again, as a season ticket holder, if you buy a season ticket up front, irregardless of where you sit, you get about a 50% discount as if you walked up and bought that same ticket at the box office 33 times. I think that's the predominant thing that people are looking for. Yes, we have to do buy-in nights. Yes, we have to do specialty nights, particularly on the weekdays. And we have to do a good job of explaining to our customers why we do that. And I think if you're willing to engage the customer and have that conversation, at least in this market, they seem to be fine with it. But yes, we do have to battle it. With that, you also have one of the smallest staffs that's full time. And mm -hmm. people don't consider that when they're thinking about a professional sports uh, arena, that you really don't have the amount of staff that you normally have. How do you kind of make that work? Is everyone a jack of all trades? Everybody, a is, a ja trades? Yeah. Everybody is a jack and, a and or a Jane of all trades for sure. And you can tell you've done this for a while because most people don't understand that. And yeah, we have a very small staff. We have six or seven full-timers, uh, and I say six or seven because there's generally one of us out of the office every day for something. And so we're really relegated to about six full-time people, and that makes it really hard when you're trying to run an event. Thankfully, we have a great staff, and we all understand our roles, but what I do today is going to be completely different than what I did tomorrow, and it's going to be the same for everyone else. I think our biggest, uh, the biggest 
deficit we face is when we want to do things that are much bigger and greater than we've done or when we have people that are unhappy about things we can't get to them as quickly as we'd like in some occasions because of the smallness of our staff. Is there really the marketing outrageously or do you have to really really work into the community itself and make sure that the community is okay with some of the things? You can't just throw a Michael Vick dog night. I think it's a combination of the two. Uh, I think in a smaller market you have to have a good pulse on what the community wants, thinks, feels. Uh, I think that we do that very well. Uh, we, we won the Community Relations Franchise of the Year uh, for the Central Hockey League last year. So it's not just about us being out and about with our mascot and our players. It's about engaging the customer as well and listening to what it is they want to tell you. Uh, it doesn't matter necessarily what you may want to ask them. I think it's important to have a general conversation because inevitably they're going to tell you what you do or don't want to hear. But I think either way, the, the information from the customer is very valuable. <clears throat> the Central Hockey League in general changed over. It changed and voted itself from a one entity into many entities, like a lot of leagues. Mm -hmm. How did that uh, change the perception of the CHL here, or did that even matter? Well, I think we're still in the midst of it. The owners purchased the league last year uh, from, the, from the bigger parent company that's had the league for many, many years. Uh, is it a good or a bad thing? I, I don't know yet. I, I think more, more so than then the, the latter, the former, would come into play. I think it's a good thing. I think it will be a good thing. But I think it's going to take several years to play out. I mean, let's face it, the, the minor league hockey aura right now and the landscape of minor league hockey is pretty unstable, in my opinion. Uh, you know, you obviously have the American League, the ECHL, us, and the SPHL. And at some point, again, in my opinion, we've got to have a single-A, double-A, triple-A, NHL, just like baseball. Uh, it works in baseball, and I, I think that's what we have to go to because I find – even from my seat, we compete for too many markets, we compete in too many cities, and inevitably it just drives the cost of, uh, in particular, the two leagues at our level, it just drives our cost up. With leagues and stability, does that also challenge with you guys because of the fact if a team folds, in a way you almost are fighting against only playing five other teams instead of yeah, eight and that, or ten? Yeah, that's where it becomes difficult to have a league. I mean, you have to have other member teams, as you mentioned, to have a viable league. Our I guess deficiency here is just our geography and uh, that's what drives our cost up and so when we're in Prescott Valley and Prescott Arizona and we're playing a team in Brampton i.e. Toronto Ontario Canada Toronto Ontario Canada is great for our league it's our first Canadian team but for us that would be a probably a four-day bus ride and so knowing that we really can't ride the bus that far we have to fly which again raises our costs we're okay with that to a point as long as there's some westward movement, if you will, in the Central Hockey League and some consideration for new teams out in our direction as well uh, to help offset our travel cost to Brampton. You're in one of the nicer facilities for even a CHL or even an ECHL. I mm -hmm. mean, a lot of people would be salivating at this, but how do you make this work for really the corporations that are around here? There's really a fixed amount of people that you have to go after. There is, and that's, that's, one of the, that's one of the challenges that we face in such a small market. Um, you know, people have their perceptions, whether they're true or untrue from the past, and we still find ourselves today battling some of that. And I think we've done a good job of overcoming uh, the majority of those. But there still are some issues that we and every other minor league team and every other sport deals with. Um, for us, yeah, we have to have everybody participating to make it work. Fortunately, we're the only professional sports franchise in northern Arizona. So that, that is one thing that helps, but we're far from where we want to be and where we need to be as a franchise. Uh, we're, we're seeing the lever uh, tick up just a little bit. Unfortunately, it's not on a grade that's like this. It's more on a grade that is uh, about 10% above flat, which is a good thing because the first two years I was here, that wasn't the case. So we are seeing some growth. We have had to change what we do in order to create some of that growth. And one of those things is we don't give away tickets. With that, you also have to make sure deliverables, which people don't understand, especially in the corporate space, is it's not just putting up a sign. It's also deliverables. How do you do that and activate? I think uh, activation is, is, is the biggest and, and most key word. I, I think that if you have a contract and you have all the deliverables, even if you deliver, uh, but you don't necessarily activate, I think that's a problem. And uh, again, I think we have a staff that understands what activate means and it understands that we have to engage our customer regularly. Uh, we have someone in our office and her sole job is to fulfill what it is that myself or any of the other staff members bring to the table. But by the same token, it's to create a relationship. 
because unfortunately as the general manager wearing a lot of hats I don't always have time to do that as much as I'd want so with that said I think going to them uh, not just delivering on what's in the initial contract but coming back and giving them options that don't cost them anything for the future that also doesn't cost our business anything but provides true value to the customer you got into this business, I'm sure you thought the title of GM meant that you would move around player rosters and you know do analytics maybe a little bit. So you kind of look a little more like Brad Pitt than a lot of GMs, <laughs> but I mean, really that, that isn't what a GM does. Explain what a GM in the minor oh, leagues my do, gosh. because I think people have a misconception, especially when they're in school thinking about going into sports. Well, I mean, it's, I wish I could answer the question... Uh, the abridged version, but I'll try my best to give you the Cliff Nose version of, of, of what I do every day. Every day for me is different. That's why I love my job. Uh, yesterday, as an example, I had to go about an hour away because I had a, a problem with a client. It was an ongoing problem. It continued to fester, and so I needed to snuff it out and come to an agreement. So that took about half of my day. Uh, then I was on the phone with our coach because we have a lot of injuries, uh, trying to figure out what we're going to do, who's going to play, who's not going to play, uh, when can the next person come off injured reserve, uh, we also have some players that need some equipment to stabilize the injuries they have, so we had to order that. Um, amongst other things, uh, I, I was on the phone with several clients yesterday and had a pretty good day on, on the group sales end of things, and I think that's a, what a lot of people misperceive is people that sit in my seat that we just bark around and, and shout out orders, when in fact that's not the case. At least for my position here, I'm expected to be the number one revenue generator, and so with that said, I have to generate revenue, but I also have to manage a small staff of five or six and watch my expenses as well so whenever we go out and we look for a bus company to haul our players around for the year that's a major expense for us that's a couple hundred thousand dollar expense and that's something that takes me all summer to do because we have to have a sleeper bus and it's not the easiest thing to come up with in our location but I have to manage those expenses as well with the driver and the gas and the rental fee and the hotel and the list goes on and on but that's what makes my job fun uh, because it is literally uh, from day to day different each day, and, it, and, it, and, I, and I would say I literally touch every facet of the business every single day. Okay, so you're doing this. Uh, how do you make sure that you're really mentoring those people below you? Because while people expect you to do those things, they also expect you to groom those people as well. Probably one of our biggest struggles because of time, and we, we talk about it as a staff, one of the biggest things or the biggest thing we lack is time. Because we, all small, we are small, even though we all understand our roles, uh, if we don't stay on top of things every day, then our sales tend to wane. So there's a really interesting balance between mentoring someone and doing your own job. Uh, it's one of our one of our biggest negatives, I would say. Uh, so we we try to meet regularly. Uh, the guys beneath me in title uh, typically meet every single day. We as a staff meet once a week. Uh, we also work out in the morning. We we generally engage in some pretty mild conversation from time to time, either before, during, or after the workout so that we can cover a bit of our day before we get our day started. Um, but it's something that I try to have, not try, I do have an open door policy and everybody that works with me understands that I may not always come back and, and get in their space and say, hey, what's up, tell me what's going on today, what can I help you with? They understand that they, they can come to me. And I think that's uh, something that provides consistency because it, it gives them the full day to come in and interrupt to me, which by the way, as a, as a general manager, is the the biggest thing that we have to battle is the constant interruptions, but that's part of why we get paid. How do you relate that back to your experience starting out 20 years ago? Is it something that you kind of think about when you're, whether mentoring or when you're young and you just think, hey, I really want to do everything? Yeah, you're right. When you're younger, you, you say, hey, I, I do want to do everything. And fortunately, I had some great bosses coming up through the ranks. And, you know, I was just telling one of my coworkers the other day that, my boss finally, because I kept coming in and out so much, he's like, all right, Chris, stop. Get it all together. Come in either first thing in the morning or at the end of the day. Ask me the 20 questions you have, but you can't keep coming in and coming out. Well, I was a young executive or trying to be a young executive, and I thought that was the right thing to do. And in most instances, the, the person in charge, that isn't what they're looking for. We are looking for everybody to come in with all their questions at once so we can refine our day as well and be productive. But I think it is a, a function of who it is that I've worked for and how it is they taught me and how it is they handled me as a, as a youngster. Are we too title focused in this industry and are we just tr trying to work for the next promotion rather than work better at the job we're at? Really good question. I think as a, as a youngster when you're trying to break in you're definitely working for the next promotion. 
I think when you get to a certain level, and I would, I would call it assistant general manager or higher, I think that you have to go, you know what, my title doesn't really matter. I'm secure in what I do. I know that who I work for likes the job I do, and I'm not worried about my title. And that's kind of where I am now. Uh, I've been everything from a minority owner to a team president to a general manager. And even 20 to 22 years into this, my title's general manager. And that doesn't bother me. I don't need to be a team president. I don't need to be an owner. Uh, I'm content with who I am and what I do, and I know what I bring to the table. So I have the security that, regardless of title, I'm still going to do my job. Did a minority ownership drive you nuts? <clears throat> it's like you wanted to control wasn't very fun. more facets. <laughs> it wasn't very fun. Now, I, even as a little guy, obviously, when you're, when you're a little guy, you, you don't have much of a say-so. Fortunately, the five partners that I was in business with, they gave me more say-so than they probably should have. Uh, but it was a brand new baseball team actually and we're starting a brand new team your expenses are more than what they typically would be in years three four and five and I'm not a guy with wealth so when my money and it's time to put in my portion of the check above and beyond what I already have then that makes it a little difficult. Was that something that helped you in this job because now you saw it from their side of what they're really putting out as you know a lot of people go well they should just spend extra money but if you don't have it or you just got into it with certain conceptions of what you were going to have it's a little harder right you know I think those people that are in charge and and the guys that I've worked for the reason that I've enjoyed working for them in the past is simply because they had done essentially every job leading up to the job at the very top and for me it's the very same I started as an intern which most people do and worked my way up and aside from being an accountant I've held every job within a particular company and that's helped me uh, in my opinion be a, a better chief if you will because I understand their jobs better than those that maybe haven't done them I understand the sales game I understand the marketing game I understand the PR game I understand the need for the community aspect I understand price point and all of those things come into play every single day but that's what makes my job fun how are those roles changing, though, in sports? You know, you mentioned PR, you mentioned account executive. Is it really everybody has to be willing to do all things, or is there really, you know, somebody who can focus just on being a PR guy? No, I think you have to do everything, and I think that's the biggest lesson that youngsters that are still in college need to learn. you, you got to have not just an internship. You need to have more than one internship, and you have to understand that if you want to get into sports now, you have to be willing to take on a high level of responsibility right out of the gate. And I think, I, well, I shouldn't say think, I know in our staff, with our staff, everyone has a very keen sense of responsibility and accountability, and they understand what their duties are, but they also understand that there will be days when their coworkers may come to them and say, God, I really need your help. And it's out of their realm of title, but it's in their realm of responsibility, and I think that's why we function as a small group of people uh, very, very well. But I think it, it really starts with everybody understanding I have a responsibility to my duties, but also have a responsibility to my coworkers to lend a hand if need be. You're on the front lines of hiring, and to me, that means that I should ask you about sport management programs. Are they necessary, and are they something that are really teaching the youth how they should be reacting in sports? You know what? I have a real good pulse on that, and I love the question. I, I was fortunate enough to teach sport marketing at Wichita State University uh, for a couple of different years uh, as an adjunct professor. The reason I loved it more so than the job I have now is I, I was able to take my real world experiences and translate them into people that wanted to be like me. And I loved it. Uh, my students loved me because the first day of class I said, hey, who all's bought a textbook? Six hands go up. I said, take them back, keep your mom and dad's money because we're not going to operate out of a textbook. And what we did and the way I set the class up is we operated based upon my real world experiences. And so if the Daytona 500 was on, I would make them watch it, and then we would talk about the marketing aspect of the Daytona 500 or the Super Bowl or the World Series, and it was awesome. Do I think schools are doing a good job, and do I think the program's necessary? Yes, I do, but I think the scholastic um, piece of working through a textbook all the time is deficient, and I think the more that we can get kids out to sit with people like me and you and staff members that are in the market every day, I think it's a much greater benefit and I think the degree would mean more when you got out if we had more schools doing that. Do they work enough on hiring uh, from the interview process and making the students understand that it's great you have a degree but you still got to interview in a proper way? I, I think that's probably an area of need. Um, I know when I was in, in, in the teaching aspect of things we didn't do that at all. I think we talked about it maybe one class period but I think that is a, uh, an area that we need to develop. 
I think uh, kids nowadays, they want to come out, they want the office in the corner with the windows, and they want to make $50,000 a year, and it just doesn't happen. And uh, it, doesn't, it, it's, it doesn't matter what sport you're in, if you're at the minor league level, you've got to grind for about three years. At least that's been my experience for a long time. You've got to grind hard for about three years. And if you can grind hard for three years, by the time you get to that fourth year, something typically pops and your income begins to exponentially in increase. But I also think that kids are too, almost too over the top in terms of the social media side of things. And it's, it's created this gap of ineptness between the interview process and their degree. And so they're not as comfortable face-to-face -face as you and I might be um, because they weren't taught that. They were taught a different thing than, than we were as kids growing up. And I think we have to close that gap because I still think it, at the end of the day it's about presentation. Uh, I've never probably ever gotten a job necessarily as a youngster coming out because of my knowledge. It was more about my ability to think on my feet and present. Does that also come into play that not enough people are ready to make that in-person presentation, not only for you and I for an interview, but also for sales? And I get a lot of people that say, ah, that sales stuff, you keep focusing on that. Focus on branding. But isn't that really where our industry, especially at the minor league level, you better be willing to sell? Yeah, and you know, I, I, I'm a believer that you really can't brand your product without sales. If you have a great logo and people believe in your logo and they believe in your community service and you've created this brand and this aura that's good. If you don't have the sales to back it up, you don't have any team. So I think at any level, you have to have the sales aspect and if not, you're, you're kind of, in a, you're gonna fall into a pitfall. I think that's the biggest area of weakness for people that wanna get into this business is they don't necessarily understand that you have to sell. People wanna come in and they wanna be a marketer or they wanna be a PR person or they want to travel with the team, but at the end of the day, you you know, take me as the example, this is all I've ever done, and I'm still expected, even as the guy technically on top with the title, to be the number one revenue generator, and that's not going to change. Is that something as well when they think, well, you're going to have an unlimited budget? No, you've really got a set marketing budget, and it might even be lower than you think. Yeah, I find that every year, um, by my choice, it's not my owner browbeating me, but by my choice, we tend to reduce our marketing budgets, and, and that could be a mistake in hindsight. However, the reason I go down that path is I find that every year you have to find ways to be more resourceful with the funds that you do have, and that is where you have to tie back into the social media, which you can do a lot of for free, and you can get your message out there to a large segment of people. And uh, I think that's a challenge for you know, the newspaper, the TV stations, the radio, and the outdoor people, because that's traditionally 20 years ago where we spent our money. And now we're looking at other aspects to get more value for the dollars that we spend, and we're looking for more things that are free. And you're talking about radio. Is radio even important anymore? It used to be that radio was you'd actually have to pay to be on radio or have those spots or have a big uh, kind of sports uh, co uh, corporate sponsorship mm -hmm. part of it. Does that even matter as much anymore, or are there still people listening to the radio? I mean, we're doing this on a video cast. I don't think nearly as much. I know when I first started... Um, it was, a, it was a big component in what we did. When I went out to sell a package, radio was one of the number one things because people got co-op dollars if they spent money on radio. I don't find that to be the case as much anymore. I know from a play-by-play -play standpoint for our games, we don't do it anymore uh, because of the advent of CHL TV and podcasts and things of that nature. We just don't see the value in hiring someone, sending him or her on the road for half of the year uh, because we don't get anything out of them while they're on the road. So we have this big deficit on the expense side that we're not gener generating enough radio revenue to cover the expense of the radio play-by-play -play guy. I do still think it's necessary to spend money with radio in terms of marketing, particularly in a smaller market. But I think in a bigger market, uh, it's hard to get in and, and find your niche because A, of the expense and B, most of the, the air time that you want to be in is, is covered with somebody else. Where do you think uh, general manager and just minor league sports are going in general? What's the new staff going to look like 20 years from now? Be the amazing Kreskin. Oh, wow. I think you have to, I think you're going to have to be sleek no matter what, uh, and no matter what the level, and I think you're really going to have to be um, someone that can wear multiple hats. I think the days of everyone being focused in their little niche and that's only what I do, and I'm not going to do anything out of that little piece of pie. I think those days were gone probably 10 years ago. And as, we, as I get older <clears throat> and I see younger people coming in, 
I love their energy. They're, they're much smarter than I am. And I think it's always important to hire people that are better than you, that have more potential than you, and that are smarter than you. And I, and I feel like I've done that because I, I learn as much from the people beneath me in title that are much younger than me uh, as I do any part of my job every day. And I, I find that their minds work completely different than mine. And I see it with my own kids. My wife and I have three young daughters, and even 13, 10, and 9, uh, their level of intellect for podcasts and electronic equipment is off the chart. And so I am now in a position where I have to learn what they already know at 8, 9, 10 years old. So are we going to see scissor lift 2 come up because it is the off season? <clears throat> are we going to see something that really goes back to uh, you and the owners uh, being up in a scissor lift for how, how many days was it, 31? No, we were only up there for a week, but <laughs> it felt like it 31? felt like about three years. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, if we can figure out the right component to drive the right dynamic, then yeah, we'll come up with something. I, I was, I began to think about it actually on Monday, and you know, I got to tell you, it's hard to top that because we got so much attention, uh, not just locally but throughout the globe. That I don't know what we can do to to overcome that or to better that, but we're certainly going to try. Oh, good. Well, Chris Preston, thank you for coming on the podcast. I'm Troy Kirby for the Dow Sports Videocast and the Sports Business Education Network. Thank you. Thank you.